Great. So thanks everybody for joining us. And uh, uh, see, like oh, there's there's quite a few people here local to LA. Um, so, uh, but welcome from wherever you might be joining us. Um, and, and thank you for joining us for this uh, second program in the Active Voice series. Um, these conversations are focused on the intersection of art, community, and social justice. Um, tonight's conversation um, is going to be focused on wellness at home and in community. Um, my name is Eva Rodriguez, and um, I'm the Exhibition Program Production Manager at the Armory Center for the Arts. Um, and uh, I, I want to welcome you all to this conversation uh, where I'll be joined by uh, Karen Mack, um, Executive Director and Founder of LA Commons, and Nicole Rademacher, who is the artist, an artist and founding director, uh, founding director of the Acogedor Project Space. Um, it's good to see a lot of familiar faces and uh, names here in the, in the Zoom room. Um, uh, and, and it's great to see all the, the different places that everybody's joining us from. Uh, before, I, in light of this conversation on uh, wellness and um, that we're about to have, uh, I wanna start tonight's program with uh, an acknowledgement of the healing and restoration that um, needs to happen in relation to the land that we occupy. Uh, where I'm broadcasting from and the, the Arm, the land that the armory sits on is um, uh, we, we occupy a traditional Tongva uh, land. Um, it's the uh, ancestral unceded territory of the Tongva people. Uh, and we recognize them as the caretakers uh, as well as the current and future inhabitants of the land we occupy. And we, we pay them our deepest respect. Um, the way that this program is going to go tonight um, is going to be uh, we're going to uh, uh, we're going to uh, have a, a few minutes for um, I'm going to be introducing our our speakers shortly um, uh, Nicole Rodmacher and Karen Mack um, and then we'll go into a, sh a discussion on uh, our to our topic tonight uh, wellness in community and at home. And then we're gonna open it up for Q&A for the last like maybe 10 minutes um, where people can hop into the to the Zoom room. But um, I do wanna encourage everybody while we're talking to, uh, to put some comments and questions in the chat. Um, we're gonna be monitoring, monitoring the chats um, and we're hoping to continue the discussion there. Um, even though um, uh, in the beginning, it'll be uh, uh, Karen and Nicole um, uh, leading the conversation. Um, and then uh, well, we can take it from there. Uh, so, um, well, so with that, um, I wanna introduce uh, Nicole Rademacher. Um, Nicole is an artist in art and marriage and family ther therapist trainee. Uh, she serves as the founding director of Acogedor, an intimate project space that functions as an inclusive and supportive space, collaborating with BIPOC, queer, disabled, female identifying, gender nonconforming, and the adoptee community. Since the COVID-19 lockdown, Rademacher has spearheaded community-based projects launched Acogedor's online programming with an exhibition focused on work made during the pandemic. And is current, she's currently studying uh, a part of, she's currently part of a trio studying art making and well-being during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, with professional artists as part of her graduate thesis at Lo Loyola Marymount University here in LA. Um, and that is actually one of the um, one of the subjects that I hope she can elaborate on today. But before I turn it over to you, uh, you Nicole, uh, I did ask, I, I will say that I did ask um, Nicole to lead us in a bit of a grounding exercise, something I've seen her do in her own programs with Acogedor. And I think in the spirit of well-being 
and this conversation that we're about to have, uh, I want us to kind of, uh, uh, I, I hope that uh, Nicole can lead us through, through this short exercise. Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, it's really simple, it's, it's three breaths, but it's intentional. And so you breathe in through your nose for a count of four, and then you hold it for four, and then you breathe out through your mouth for a count of eight, and we'll do it three times. Um, so find a comfortable sitting position wherever you are. If you feel comfortable, you are invited to close your eyes. And we'll start to breathe in through your nose, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, and out through your mouth, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Second breath in through your nose, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, and out through your mouth two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And the last breath in through your nose, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, and out through your mouth, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so yeah, um, please um, let us know a little bit more about your practice, your projects, and um, um, uh, yeah, let's start with your artist. So if you are, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll let you be the conversation. <laughs> yeah. um, so I am uh, an artist. Um, I'm also, as you said, in the marriage and family therapy program with the clinic with a specialization in clinical art therapy at um, Loyola Marymount University here in Los Angeles. My practice um, started really visual. So photography, collage, um, text, moved into video, um, but I continually started working with the community. Um, being here uh, for such a We've been here for eight years now, um, and I'm an adoptee, which means I was adopted. Um, and I reunited with my birth family when in 2004, so it's been it's been a while. Um, I started to really delve into that and look at my community there. So it's not just adoptees, but it's also birth parents, um, foster parents, foster youth, adoptive parents, prospective parents. Um, and as I started to look at that community and started to make work about that, my um, artistic my artistic practice started to shift a little bit more to community engagement. Um, and it is through that that I found um, art therapy. And so that's kind of the shift. So um, my hope now is after having taught and, and worked in communications and things like that for so long in the arts is to now kind of merge it with um, art therapy and my art practice. Since um, March, so since COVID kind of started with this big lockdown, there have been um, two things that have happened. One, I did um, a community engagement project titled uh, Separate Together. And I did that for Drive By LA, Drive By Art LA. Um, and the goal was it happened at the end of April. I did the proposal, I think, at the beginning, or I'm sorry, the end of May, and I did the proposal at the beginning of May. And this was, everything was so new, and um, we were we were all just kind of thrown for a loop. Like, how do you not socialize with people? How do you stay six feet apart? Um, we, I don't even think we were wearing masks necessarily yet. I think maybe in California, but maybe not the rest of the country. Um, and I wanted a way for us to still figure out how to make that connection. And so drawing on my experience and um, learning at Loyola Marymount, um, I used art therapy interventions, which we, we call interventions or directives, but we can also think of them as prompts um, in order to develop a, an artwork where people would come together as a community in different spots. And um, and so it's it was made with, uh, sidewalk chalk on the sidewalk. 
people were invited to sign up via Calendly. And so they had their, their marked time that they could come in so that we could maintain the guidelines by the, the LA County Department of Public Health. And they were given a prepackaged sanitized um, pack of, of chalk and a prompt. And so people came in their own kind of pods um, or families or households or whatever it was that they came. And then they chose a piece on this large swath of, of sidewalk on Hauser in between Obama and Coliseum, which is um, just east of Culver City in Los Angeles. And it's, it's, been, it's part of um, Baldwin Hills. And so, uh, so people came on Saturday and Sunday to do that. And it took up, I would say, good two blocks. Um, it was really beautiful to see people come and, and create an artwork on one part that's without anything around it. And then people would kind of like fill that in. Um, or people would, would, I guess they were wearing masks now that I remember the, the pictures. Um, and actually I could show some of those. Um, let me pull it up. And um, so here's a family that came in to produce theirs. And there are the packets that we had. And so some people kind of went off form. They did they just did tracings. Um, families read together. Everything was specialized. Um, they're obviously from two different households, but they did the air hugs and did their artwork together. So I was trying to look at um, how to create community in this kind of bizarre time. This was also five days after the killing of George Floyd. And so there were definitely social justice was in the atmosphere. Um, after, oops. Stop sharing the screen. Um, so that was at the end of May. And after that, um, I started thinking about how else can I kind of contribute to our wellness in as artists. And I was like, well, I have a cogedor. I haven't, I wanted to do programming this summer. Um, I didn't do programming, but so a cogedor lives, it, it was, the programming happens in front of my house. It wasn't like it, it, it's the intimate project space because it's intimate. It's in my front yard. Um, I was like, well, I have the website and I'm web savvy. So why can't I do something with that? And so I decided to do an open call to artists all around the world. And there are 42 artists that participated. I believe there were five different countries represented. Um, and uh, there was work. I, I ended up curating it into four different categories of the in-between, connection, time, and little gestures. And I wanted that to be, I envisioned it as a way for us to um, document what this is and in whatever form that takes. And I, I sent out some personal um, invitations and then I, you know, I also did a, a broad call and it was interesting, some people who I sent out personal invitations to were like, I'm not making anything, I can't make anything. And I thought that was, you know, that's really interesting too. I don't have a way to document that, but you know, I can tell you anecdotally. Um, and so we did the exhibition and then I had a, a slew of, of programming. We had participatory performances. Uh, Michael Rippon did one, it was uh, Still Life Live. And so he invited people on the Tongva land um, and I believe one person was from, was participating from New York. And so we also did a land tribute there too, um, to stand for 30 minutes there and, and hold that space. Um, and as a meditative way, and I mean, you can, I can maybe send you a link to his project so he, you can read more about that. But that was one of the participatory performances where we invited people to sign up ahead of time and then be a part of that. And then there was discussion. And then we also did um, discussions just from the artists that were, um, that were part of the different four themes um, and to go deeper into their work. And then uh, lastly, the programming I did at the very end of the year is called Invisibilities Sessions. And I, I'm planning on continuing it. Um, the idea behind that 
is that we have so many things that that we're invisible to the world as whether it's something with family uh, grief immigration mental health stigma um body image so those are some of the topics that we touched at the end of 2020 um and we talked about that in in um hour and a half long conversations between mainly three people that i kind of facilitated um and that was really to think about our wellness our mental health wellness um and then i i had to take a hiatus to be perfectly transparent with you guys um i have a diagnosis of bipolar 2 and in about november um i had a mix episode come on and so by the time i was doing the programming for january and february and and march i realized that it that it wasn't possible for me to continue that way so i have lots of programming saved and lots of people who we will continue maybe in june um but for my own wellness i knew that i couldn't continue to serve the community without without coming making sure that i'm okay thank you for being so open about that and sharing um let me um yeah it, it's it's so um like being vulnerable in virtual space is like i think fairly new for a lot of people these days and i think um and, and well thank you for um sharing sharing that and um I, it's it's been so hard to or this past year just um man, being able to manage this virtual space and and just uh having authentic conversations and relationships i think um so thank you for the uh, sharing some of that programming that you did because um I, I i i knew a couple of people that participated in those and um it it, it i i learned some new things about about them and uh, yeah it was really um uh, really great to listen to those conversations um so yeah um I'm going to now introduce uh, Karen Mack. Um, she, Karen Mack is the founder and executive director of Alley Commons, uh, an organization dedicated to promoting Los Angeles diverse neighborhoods through locally based interactive artistic and cultural program. Alley Commons has implemented community art projects, tours and classes in partnership with organizations such as the Fowler Museum at UCLA, National Endowment for the Arts, the LA Department of Cultural Affairs, and LA County Department of Arts and Culture. She holds an MPA from Harvard University and an MBA from the John, John Anderson School of Management at UCLA, where she currently teaches a course on social justice artivism. She's a member of the Los Angeles City Planning Commission. So Karen, uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, so now I, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about Alley Commons, your own uh, um, uh, practices through, or your project, your recent projects in this past year. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> um, it's kind of a treat to be reunited with, you know, folks that I've had long and, um, rich relationships with um, through working together and you know being colleagues on this journey. Um, so I started LA Commons um, about 20 years ago, started thinking about what it was that I wanted to do with my life, like how I could actually um, weave my life and my work together um, because um, I've always had the um, belief that life is about life, it's not about work, and you really want your work to support who you are, who you really are, and, um, you know, so you can express that in the world. And so I basically built an organization that is, you know, a reflection of me. You know, I thought about what really I wanted to... Um, what, what I was passionate about. Um, and and um, it was 
you know, the arts and the power of the arts to connect people. You know, I'm remembering back when I was thinking about the name, you know, I was thinking about community and connection and, you know, all of these words and, you know, came up with the, the idea about, um, uh, that's true, I'm looking at the chat, it's true. Um, and so um, life is about living and eating and being around people. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, I came up with the name LA Commons, which is a variant on that idea of connecting. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, so that's really what we've been doing uh, for uh, this 20 years is uh, supporting people in neighborhoods to connect with each other. And I feel like, you know, what this pandemic has really lifted up is how important those can, I mean, I knew the connections were important, but you know, now I don't have to hit other people over the head and say, wait, we need to connect to each other because everybody recognizes now, you know, whether it's at home or it's at school or it's, you know, uh, in the public realm, people, that's the thing. I mean, I think that's the thing we all miss the most is like connecting with other people. Um, and the thing actually that I've enjoyed the most, I have to say, is connecting with my family. And I feel like you know, if there's any, um, the, the silver lining that I'm sure you've all had conversations about is this opportunity to develop deeper and stronger bonds with the people you love. Hopefully they're still around, which, you know, that's the nightmare part of this scenario. But, um, you know, that I feel like that <clears throat> has been one of the most protective factors for us in our household is that, you know, being around each other and just, you know, supporting each other and having, um, you know, being able to share experiences, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I think what we've done um, at LA Commons is kind of created that space since the pandemic started, you know, although virtual for our youth and community members to find um, that connection. I'm just going to show you a few slides. I know I don't have a huge amount of time, but um, uh, <clears throat> so um, let's see. You. So um, uh, I, I just basically told you what our mission is to. Uh, you know, we, we really use kind of stories as, as one of our key currencies in terms of the relationship building, bringing people together to share their stories and then, uh, you know, working as a community led by artists and youth to transform those into narratives that really reflect um, uh, the neighborhood. Um, this was a, a word cloud that was done uh, after our strategic planning process, people, um, uh, you know, said what they thought about us and, and, you know, community is the biggest word there. So this project um, was really amazing because we, we uh, work, um, uh, you know, we, our programs are basically artist residencies in neighborhoods. So we um, hire artists, a, a team of a lead and an associate and a youth mentor, and then they work with a team of young people <clears throat> who are 15 to 25, um, generally around 15 young people, to implement an art project that, you know, is about telling the story, the community stories, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of gathering those stories and then transforming them to art. And the young people, they we were all they were already doing a mental health project because you know um, if we didn't know it, there was a mental health crisis among youth even before the pandemic. So, so they just kind of quickly uh, shifted and really focused it on the pandemic and helping people um, deal with their their issues. So they created this social media campaign called You Are Not Alone. And so this is one of the images that came out of that. And um, this is another one. <clears throat> um, and you can see the um, this was a post. And then they also, which was so cool, they created this this online bingo game with um, 
uh, coping mechanisms uh, for um, dealing with the pandemic, like, you know, uh, support, providing support to yourself and others um, at this time. And I think they got like 200 people to participate and, you know, that was rippling out into the community. So that was a pretty um, cool result. And I think, you know, what this project did more than even the uh, support to the broader community, just that that group having that touchstone every week, you know, because we moved to virtual right away. So every, you know, Thursday they could come and they knew they'd have a crew to meet with and, you know, express themselves, you know, um, be vulnerable. Uh, and, um, you know, it became like a, a real important part of their life at that moment. Um, you know, again, hearkening back to this idea of connection. Uh, this is um, just an example of a virtual um, uh, experience with our young people who, um, in this instance, they were doing a medallion project. This is actually a different project for uh, uh, Fremont High School. Um, and, uh, you know, they uh, created art that focused on um, uh, the issues at hand, which obviously homelessness is one of the key issues that um, they're experiencing. And the, what happens is the artist takes the images that they create and then creates <clears throat> the final work. And so that's what it looks like on the fence. Um, this was another one that was created. Um, and this project actually is an interesting project because it is, um, it's at the site of Fremont High School and it, they have an incredible wellness center there um, that's open to the public. Um, so there's a health clinic, there's this beautiful garden that is on site. And um, also they're just building a dental clinic. And we just got an NEA grant um, along with the community coalition to bring um, arts, uh, uh, basically residencies. I mean, what we're, what we're hoping to create is something called a healthy culture hub where we're adding culture into this mix of ser health services so that the arts are really seen as a tool for healing on the same level as you know a, a traditional clinic and and really grounded in the community's uh, healing practices um, part of that grant is going to be uh, doing some asset mapping don't have PTSD ever um, and uh, <laughs> and Nicole um, and uh, uh, you know to uncover these uh, culture bearers and artists who can be you know central to this idea of having a hub in the community that's embedded in you know this this healthy space um, you know, where people can go and experience the arts as a healing uh, mechanism. This was one of the things that we did. I don't think this is live. No, it's not. But um, we had our artists um, do some um, art um, activities. So this, speaking of chalk, um, so she's talking about um, uh, how you can take chalk and just do a creative activity yourself, you know, out on the sidewalk and, you know, have a great experience as a family, um, uh, you know, a great art experience. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not expensive. Uh, and, you know, this Fremont High School is in the heart of South LA. So, so this was aimed at that population. Um, and we did a yoga video and, you know, a couple of other uh, 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 clips that that really were aimed at giving the community some some uh, you know ability to, to interact with the arts as a healing mechanism uh i think i probably want to stop now but this just to go quickly this is our day of the ancestors that brings the entire community together and it was virtual but you know i it it um i think served it as a touchstone particularly following the George Floyd uh, incident, the murder, because it was, it's really focused on black joy and the African diaspora. So 
we were really able to lift up the beauty of uh, our community and and give people a, a, a way to celebrate it, you know, in the face of, you know, this horrific situation. Um, so, um, so I think I will stop there because I know we want to have a conversation. Um, so uh, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Let me just bring Cole back. Um, yeah, thank you. It's uh, it's amazing how just seeing those images of people in community and expressing their traditions is bringing back like these feelings I had when we were working with the community and in those spaces. Um, it 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 it's def I'm definitely missing those moments. Mm -hmm. Um, I do want to acknowledge some, I'll start the discussion with something um, that you brought up, Karen, or that you made reference to. And I, cause I do want to acknowledge the, the, the amount of loss that we've had this past year. Um, we're speaking about wellness today, but I think this wellness becomes such an important subject because of the extraordinary amount of loss and grief and, just uh, this this past year has has uh, brought many challenges, and um, I, I think to not acknowledge that would would, would I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that um, because um, I mean there's been talk of like these monuments to the to the loss we've had like over five hundred thousand lives lost now this past year due to the pandemic. But and and many of us has not have not had time to process that. Um, but and so a lot of these mechanisms in like community, um, like as as a global community, we've all like kind of been experiencing this this loss. So um, I I, I want to start the conversation, kind of just acknowledging that and um, um, talking about some of those, those like moments that we've had this past year where we've been able to um, kind of pull ourselves up out of these moments or uh, some of the, the art activities or, or strategies that have come out of uh, some of those, those, those moments of those challenging moments. Um, have either of you experienced or had any of those breakthrough moments uh, that you'd like to share? You mean in terms of uh, having some creativity emerge out of um, loss? I mean, yeah. one, of the, one of the challenges I talked about that youth project, I think one of the students on that project lost both her parents um, during that project. So one of the parents died of COVID and one of them, I think, had already had a long illness. And, you know, and she showed up. I mean, like mm -hmm. that was her... Um, uh, her saving grace. Um, and when, before we started this conversation, one of the things that I was thinking about, there's a class on happiness that's taught at, um, it's an online class out of Yale um, that's like the most, uh, most uh, subscribed um, online class. And it's a class on happiness. And one of the key things, there's three things that, I wonder if anybody can guess what the three things are. Like, let me give you a moment to put it in the chat. What do you think the three things, the three most important ingredients for happiness uh, are? Um, it's a way to involve you guys in the conversation. Yeah, I'm really curious. That's, uh... Come on, guys. Don't think about it too hard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna say food I don't think anybody is, <laughs> but that that has been huge uh during this um time at home I I so did did everybody go I think so okay I'll tell you so it's it's um um gratitude so I saw somebody said gratitude uh helping others and sleep those are the three most important ingredients sleep is i mean big. i i think the connection i mean i think some of these other things that people have said are also important but 
you know, in terms of the actual research around happiness, those are the three things. So it's probably a, a close four. Yes. I'm for, and unfortunately I, that is showing up on my scale actually. So, um, <laughs> That's certainly kept me, <laughs> that's been a protective factor, to, a little too protective <laughs> since this pandemic. Um, so, um, but yeah, I mean, I think like for her coming to be part of this group and like reaching out to others was a really important, you know, opportunity for her just to cope with, um, you know, that tremendous loss. Mm -hmm. So... Nicole, do you have any? any I, kind of I mean, as far as like loss, like losing someone to COVID or to death, I, mean, I don't. Um, or just like, I mean. It, but I think that the loss yeah. of the connection was, that was my inspiration for, for what I, I mean, I'm, I'm, an, in, I'm an introverted extrovert. So um, I was like, I'm fine to stay home, but there's still, there's things that we need and, and I recognize that in myself and I recognize that other people needed it too. So I think that, that kind of pushed my creativity to what I did this past year. Yeah, and so similar to you, like these conversations or like the idea for this conversation series um, as my baby cries in the background <laughs> uh, is came out of uh, this kind of acknowledgement of a loss of these connections and like relationships that have been either dormant hopefully not lost because um, it's been over a year since I've checked in with some people. But um, yeah, that's, uh, that's another kind of like a, a type of loss that, that I think we're, we're going to have to, especially when we, re we, we start returning more to social spaces, um, I, like we're going to start seeing where those voids, where those voids are. Um, once we, we notice that, that like, it's been over a year and like the people that um, we've, we, we've been surrounded by or like before the pandemic are like um, there's, uh, they're, they're missing or, um, or, or we start um, wanting to interact with them again. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's, and it's interesting, my daughter, you know, she just went back to school this week. She was supposed to go back in the last week. She was nauseous like every day. And I think it's because like, it is like difficult, like to, like, it's just this mixed emotion of like making those connections, reconnecting, like, am I going to be accepted? You know, what's that going to be like, you know, so, um, you know, they're kind of a little barometer as adults, we're probably not going to admit that, but um you know, it's interesting to watch that process because, you know, we're going to all have to go through that eventually. So what's that? I'll admit it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to be, I'm going to have to uh, learn, relearn to be social and, and, right. and I, IRL. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And if, if anybody in the, in the chat has had um, any uh, recent social experiences, uh, that they'd like to um, highlight or part of the relearning process uh, that they'd like to highlight, please dr drop it in there. Um, but um, I, uh, Nicole, you brought up something that I, I also want to highlight because we're, we're also speaking about home, uh, like wellness at home and, and really what, what that means. Like uh, uh, I, I want to bring attention to some of the self-care practices that came up during the the uh, um, pandemic, uh, Karen, you brought up like the yoga classes, the art uh, making, the virtual art making. Um, uh, and so has there been something specific, like really um, intentional that has helped uh, through this, like, uh, I guess quarantining was new for most of us, even I, I myself, I too consider my, myself an introverted extrovert. So I, for, like spending a, a time in front of a computer for hours and hours uh, seemed natural to me, but um, but I think there is some some another type of loss there um, that we have to substitute those kind of social relationships and interactions, the community element, right, so with with other 
uh, forms of engagement. So um, aside from the, the, our art practices, uh, what other kind of strategies did you um, take to? I, think I mean, for, oh, go ahead, Nicole, sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, I think for me, and then with my experience um, being a graduate student, um, so working with clients, and a lot of them not having the vocabulary of self-care, but knowing that it's something important um, as a clinician for them. Uh, it was taking the time to figure out what they already know how to do that works for them. Um, and because sometimes that is just eating as we've talked about many times right now. <laughs> um, and sometimes it's, it's eating slowly. Um, and sometimes it's, choosing what exactly what it is that you want to eat. Um, and there are other things, there's a walk, there's a, you know, doing those three breaths that we did at the beginning and just nothing else. Um, but what is it that they do that they put on a priority list um, for themselves? And so I think that's one thing for me is before the pandemic, I had this really rigid idea of what self-care was. And um, through having to help others find the self-care that works for them, I've gotten a, a much broader understanding of what self-care can be. Yeah, I think for me, um, you know, I talk about a couple things that have um, changed. And one of the big ones is like, I really got in touch with this idea of abundance. Like I am like super cheap. Like my parents, my depression era parents really taught me well about like, you know, pinching a penny. And so like, I would always like, no, I'm not spending money for, you know, extra money for the better, you know, whatever it is, jam or, you know, whatever. But like, during the pandemic, I was just like, no, it's the pandemic, I'm going to treat myself. <laughs> and so, um, so I just like, you know, I just free myself of that, that, you know, it's really kind of limiting in terms of, um, um, you know, the way to live like that, that way of just, you know, considering every dollar as opposed to your own happiness. And what's so interesting is like, I started doing that. And then my husband like got a $20,000 raise on his job. And then like, I got hired to like teach a class at UCLA. And, you know, it's like, it's like you know, all that new age abundance stuff maybe works, huh? Because things started flowing, even though we're in the midst of a pandemic. So, um, Anyway, that was really good. And, and just like cooking, I cook like almost every night now, which, you know, that would, yeah, that would have been a miracle before. And, um, you know, it's just like my, my sanctuary to cook, you know, turn on the daily <laughs> um, or, you know, some other podcast and just like go to town in the kitchen. It's, it's amazing how, um, relaxed I get, you know, once I'm done and cook dinner and, you know, have sit down and actually eat the food with my family, which, you know, that was a whole nother issue. So um, anyway, I, I think yeah. we should hear from our, our audience here. Yeah, yeah, that's, it's right about time. If there's any questions, um, feel free to, to ask them now, or also feel free to pop in with your, uh, anything you wanna lift up, any strategies, wellness strategies you, you want to lift up uh, in this conversation that, that you've seen or you've practiced yourself. I um, forgot to mention, and then I just remember because it was part of the whole happiness thing, is uh, helping others, that I found that a lot of my clients like to help their family members, and then now with remembering what you said about the, the three elements of happiness from the Harvard class, I wanna lift that up, altruism. Yeah. So yeah. What, are you guys, what are you guys doing for your happiness? Or is that why you're here? <laughs> I will say similar, like uh, Nicole, this, it was one of the highlights for me, like um, after, like when the, some of the regular, the lockdown regulations started to loosen, 
was seeing how much joy people got from being outdoors. Mm. Um, and I mean, it, 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 like people walking uh, in the neighborhood, using public space in a way that I think public planners had dreamed of for for so long. Um, but yeah, that was like one of the highlights for me in terms of like finding that it's like space for tranquility and um, contemplation outdoors. Yeah, we went on a lot of hikes. We were going on hikes every weekend. I mean, we've kind of slowed down on that, but but that was that. I mean, we're so lucky in LA to have all of this incredible nature, like so close. It's it's really, um, you know, we we discovered some new places that are amazing. So, um, oh yeah, music. Yeah, mm-hmm. music is big. Mm-hmm. Definitely. One of our colleagues had this really fun dance party. Um, I, I think you guys know Leticia. She had for her birthday. She had this dance party. It was so fun, like you know, just stuff like that. It, of course, virtual, but still really fun. And um, and speaking of that, like kind of a virtual creativity, performance, music. Um, it, if anybody wants to lift up or share any of the uh, great artwork that has been uh, like virtual that has come out of this space uh, uh, really early on when Zoom started to be the platform of choice, um, you, you would see people kind of using the, the platform really crea- creatively. Oh yeah, Victoria uh, brought up um, a snail mail letters to friends. Yeah, mail art saw <laughs> a a pretty big resurgence during yeah 18th street is doing uh hold on i don't want to misquote it mail art for wellness wow i saw that yeah yeah let me let me put the link in the chat for you guys that sounds amazing yeah Yeah. i mean uh, yeah when when it first happened i wrote all my friends a letter um but of course i'm not i haven't done that in a while oh meditation with a group of people that's great georgina I don't do group meditation. It was really fun. And um, most of the people I didn't know, so that it was also creating, I think, a, an environment of trust in, <clears throat> excuse me, getting to know people during this very odd time period. You know, one of the things that I, uh, that has come to my awareness too, is that when we are not in touch with strangers, we start to lose our humanity because it's strangers that give us faith in other people. And so, you know, if we just are subject to this barrage of negativity that of course, you know, the toxic one was spouting and all of his minions, you know, it really was uh, traumatic. So, you know, that, I think that, connection goes beyond just the people we know but connecting with with the other so that um you know everybody is humanized um you know that's when i think about all the hate that's happening now too i think that's really part of it also yeah that's that's really powerful karen um yeah it has it 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 was really interesting meeting new people uh, during this, during, because uh, meeting them virtually, because mm-hmm. it was like kind of practicing some of those like social norms, um, and being social in this like kind of like frame here. So Michael um, said, "What are we looking forward to post pandemic? Traveling. <laughs> I miss traveling." And so, and, uh, yeah, and just speaking from this space of like with arts organizations, I mean, uh, we, we um, um, the, one of the things we're really looking forward to is that community element again and seeing how that is gonna change or how we'll have to adapt to the new normal. Because a lot of us um, work with communities that, that we were kind of like, we, uh, were a, uh, 
approaching our work in uh, in this mode that we always thought that art was a, a key part of well-being. Um, but I think that even that is even more relevant these days. Mm. So true. Well, we'll have to wait to see what my paper says. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let me put a link. So I can't say too much about it because we're still writing it. But um, so it's art making and well-being with professional artists during the pandemic. And I'm going to put a link in here so you can send me your email address if you want the paper when we publish it. But it's been um, really, really interesting. That's great. perfect. Thank yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Is there is there anything uh, like any key trends that you can share? Like anything? I mean, it's it's popular? generally positive. Um, there have been a lot of people have kind of changed how their practices or it's shifted in certain ways. Um, a lot of people noted that it, um, that it's been good to, um, that, that being at home has moved it in, in, in different ways as well. Um, I think that's all I can really say right now because we're, we're still writing the a teaser. It's a section. teaser. <laughs> Stay tuned. I, I, I feel like um, this, you know, this, that's what this time is really about is transformation. You know, I mean, even though it's so painful, it's really like we're kind of in this portal and, um, you know, like yesterday or when was the verdict on Tuesday? That was mm -hmm. like a little glimmer of light, you know, at the end of the tunnel, but we're still like, you know, struggling. I tell you, Uncle Joe, though, he's got it going on in terms of like, climates like 50 percent decrease and you know it's just the opposite of when i was listening to the news before i mean that's a coping mechanism right there just to have mm -hmm. like somebody who's actually working in the white house <laughs> yeah and i think um as, as you mentioned uh tuesday's news i think uh something that has come from this time is I think a lot of us are, are, are growing to be more honest with ourselves and with those around us about how we feel, like um, what makes us comfortable, like what um, I think we're, we're with this kind of new normal and like, uh, like I, I feel like certain communication avenues have been more normalized so that we, we have the opportunity to express like, uh, when things aren't okay, um, like, in, especially in a workplace environment, I feel like a lot of workplaces have been focusing on, like, wellness and addressing, I mean, at least a lot of the language has, you know, we'll see in practice how, how that actually plays out. And just, just like what's acceptable, like, you know, like abuse in the workplace is like, you know, people are like, uh-uh, I don't care what kind of, you know, power you have, you cannot, abuse people you know so that's a really healthy direction that people are getting um you know they're being held accountable for that behavior definitely um so we're almost at time here if there are any so well actually for the last as we close i want to leave us with a couple of calls to action from our guests and if there's anything that anybody wants to share in the chat if you haven't already um uh and the call to action can be something that like um uh, projects that you want to highlight either from uh uh that you want to share that you're doing that you've seen in the community um and these are things that uh uh we're invited on us here in the room are invited to take action on not just um uh, see from afar, but actually like uh, uh, take an active part uh, part part in um, doing and participating. So um, yeah, if, if, Karen, if you want to close this out with your uh, sure. uh, call to action, and then we'll we'll hear from Nicole. Sure. Um, so we uh, last year um, we uh, created this project. We were going to celebrate our twentieth anniversary, but you know that was the timing was a little off. So instead of focusing on us, we decided to create this project called Creating Our Next LA. And it's really focused on bringing people together to share their stories. And 
with an, with the idea that, you know, if we can talk about how we're envisioning, how we're dreaming about, you know, led by, you know, those great imaginers, artists and youth, um, to, you know, just imagine what we want to see at the end of this tunnel in, in, you know, our, in Los Angeles and, you know, environs. And so, um, you know, it's a great opportunity um, to connect with people who you might not know. So I put the link in the chat, creatingournextla.com. So come and join us and um, share your story and connect with other people um, to make, you know, our communities better um, post-pandemic. Karen, I will say that as soon as you said that, I want to clip that out with like imaginers, the imaginers quote with children and youth, or oh, sorry, artists and youth. Yeah. Uh, I want to, I want to, I want our communications team to share that little clip. Oh, it's good. so good. Thank um, you. Yeah, so the, uh, Nicole, uh, your call to action. I saw you put uh, a link in the chat as well. Yeah, well, I'm the 18th Street thing and then to find out about our paper. And then I put the Cogedor uh, website. So you can go there. So when I restart the invisibilities conversations, you can um, be a part of that. Um, that's, all, that's all I really have. Thank Plus you, your um, paper, come on. Well, you yeah, know, the paper's in there too. Should, I, should, I, should, yeah. I, should I do that one again that? just to make sure? <laughs> yeah, so the paper, that, and 18th Street. There's another one. There. Great. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and if anybody, I'll, if, I'll, I'll give one, um, if anybody else wants to jump in just to unmute themselves for one last quick um, Shout out. If not, we'll, we'll call it uh, an, an evening. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, thanks Karen uh, and Nicole uh, for this extraordinary conversation. It's been um, uh, definitely lifted my spirits. I was uh, coming in here at the end of the, in the evening kind of like tired out already after a long day of work but I, I and usually zooms are, are so like draining like on the eyes and just, um this was really uplifting so thank you so much thank you um, thank, thank you for inviting us yeah, yeah and thanks You're everyone welcome. for joining us thank you irene so satsos for um uh, uh monitoring a chat and being here to support and uh, leslie ito from the army um Thanks, everybody. So, so yes, great to really connect nice. with my Armory friends. <laughs> Love it. See Was you guys later. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.